from your local election headquarters. Welcome to the Congressional District 3 debate. Democratic candidate and businesswoman Susie Lee from Las Vegas and Republican candidate and businessman Danny Tarkanian, also from Las Vegas, go head to head in our debate. From your local election headquarters and the 8 News Now studios in Las Vegas, the Congressional District 3 debate starts now. Thanks for joining us for part two of our Congressional District 3 debate. I'm Patrick Walker and this is Steve Sebelius. We will be your moderators today. This debate was previously taped. Both candidates met our criteria, which you can see on our website at lasvegasnow.com. The format for this debate will include questions for both candidates to answer, individual questions for each candidate, and closing statements. We'd like to thank both Susie Lee and Danny Tarkanian for participating in the debate. We're going to jump right in with questions for both candidates. They will have 60 seconds to answer, and that's followed by 30 seconds for each rebuttal. If either Steve or I ask a follow-up question, they will have 30 seconds to answer that as well. Let's get to it. Well, you have both called for changes to our current health care system, uh, either by repealing the Affordable Care Act or replacing parts of it. Both of you have cited the rising costs of health care as reasons why. So, Ms. Lee, we'll begin with you. You are first on the question with a minute to respond. Uh, tell us a specific policy that you would uh, champion to rein in the cost of health care while also covering the most people. Uh, you know, this issue is incredibly personal to me. My father was laid off at the age of 57. Uh, I grew up in Ohio. He was part of this, uh, the Rust Belt and unfortunately was unable to find work uh, comparable to what he had. My mother suffered a heart attack at the age of 64. They both had pre-existing conditions and were not able to afford uh, health insurance and almost lost their home because of the cost of her treatment in the hospital. You know, so making sure that we're covering pre-existing conditions is incredibly important. You know, the Affordable Care Act is not perfect. Uh, it is, uh, but we saw a 42% increase in uninsured people in Nevada who uh, now have access to health insurance. So I believe that we can uh, take steps to rein in the cost of health insurance. I want to see subsidies that help middle and low income uh, families afford health insurance. I think that can be uh, one of the changes. Mr. Tarkanian, same question. Uh, give me a specific policy that you would champion to rein in the cost of health care while also providing uh, the greatest blanket of coverage to the most people. Well, the, you have a minute. The entire uh, conversation with my opponent, she never mentioned how she'd bring down costs, except having more federal subsidies, which are paid for by the taxpayers. That's not raining down costs. The problem with the Affordable Care Act is it's not affordable. It's, it's too costly for the middle class, hardworking Americans who are stuck having to pay their own health insurance premiums, like my family. Our health premiums went up from 480 a month to 1840 Our deductibles from 1000 to 5000 and our co-pay to see a specialist, $25 to 150 My son had a stroke when he was four and a half. He's going to have a pre-existing condition the entire life. It's not fair to make people with pre-existing conditions pay more. So I, and, and that's one of the things already in the Affordable Care Act. That's not going to drive down the prices. There are many things that you could do to drive down the prices. Allowing people to purchase insurance across state lines. Every time we create more competition in our country, we get a better product at a lower cost. And also getting the health care system more into the free market principles where there's more competition, more options. The Unaffordable Care Act has limited our options. Only two insurance companies here in Clark County and only one in 14 other counties. Ms. Lee, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Uh, you know, if you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you, you, if you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you repeal uh, protections for pre-existing conditions. That's just a fact. And what has happened under this Republican administration is basically whittling away at those protections. And more than that, the tax bill that was passed, we're going to see over an $800 increase in premiums for Nevada families. Mr. Tarkan, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, first of all, uh, there is a way to repeal the Affordable Care Act and pass something else that would have pre-existing conditions of protection, and that's what should happen. And you talk about an $800, $800 increase in our health insurance problem, uh, policies. I just discussed with you, mine went up with over $1,000 since Obamacare has been passed, and I'm a typical middle-class, hard-working Nevadan who pays for her own health insurance. Well, this issue came up in the first part of our debate. Let's talk more in depth about Yucca Mountain. Mr. Tarkanian, in February of this year, you told the Nevada Appeal, quote, with Yucca Mountain, Nevada has the opportunity to become a world leader in the reprocessing of nuclear fuel and eliminate 97% of our country's nuclear waste. In pushing to revive the project, the Trump administration recognizes how important Yucca Mountain is to Nevada and America, unquote. And Ms. Lee, on your campaign website, you say, quote, 
I am staunchly opposed to dumping the nation's nuclear waste in our backyard. It's a matter of when, not if, there will be a devastating accident." Uh, end quote. Uh, so for Mr. Tarkanian, with a minute uh, to reply, how can you assure Nevadans that the transportation and reprocessing of nuclear waste at Nevada will be safe? Well, that's a great question. First of all, we have a serious problem right now because we have 100 above ground sites where nuclear spent fuel is currently stored. One of them, 300 miles plus outside of uh, Las Vegas, right next to San Diego and Los Angeles. If you're talking about a catastrophe happening, that's where it's going to happen. Second of all, we have been transporting nuclear spent fuel through the state for over de three decades now, and there hasn't been an accident yet. We could try to fight the federal government and say we're not going to do anything here in, in, uh, with Yucca Mountain, and they're going to force. Uh, Yucca Mountain to be a storage facility, which nobody wants here in Southern Nevada. My uh, alternative is a responsible alternative. It solves the problems of the currently above ground sites. It solves the problems of reprocessing and not storing it here in Nevada. It would create millions, if not billions of dollars for the people of Nevada that we could put in our education system, in our health care system. It would create thousands of high paying jobs and make UNLV and UNR into the leading research institutions in the entire world. It's a responsible alternative. Hmm. Ms. Lee, uh, uh, to, to you on this issue, why would you oppose Yucca Mountain uh, if it does have the economic ben benefits that Mr. Tarkanian just mentioned and if the people in the community where it will be located seem to want the project? You know, I'm going to join uh, bipartisan leaders uh, in this state since 1987 who have fought this dangerous concept of transporting nuclear and by the way it's high level nuclear waste there is nuclear waste being transported on our roads but it's low level so we're talking about high level nuclear waste being transported uh, basically on the railroad right behind the strip on our highways and again it's not a matter of if it's not a matter of when and I'm here to represent Congressional District 3 and our economic engine for our state is our tourism economy and this is a dangerous concept and not only that reprocessing waste is is a naive concept first of all the copious amounts of water it takes secondly all of the plants nuclear plants in this country are being decommissioned they're at the end of their useful life who's buying this new reprocessed fuel i mean if anything there's just going to be storing our fuel and by the way the doe has lied to us uh, before mr Tarkanian, 30 seconds to uh, low level rebut. nuclear spent fuel uh, will cause the same catastrophe as high level. It's uh, just a, uh, a talking point trying to scare the public. It's still nuclear spent fuel going through our, our, uh, our state. Now, again, another scare tactic is where my opponent says you're going to bring it through railroad tracks through, through Las Vegas. If we work with the federal government, we can find a place through rural Nevada where it's not going to be going through. Uh, second, the last thing is France reprocesses 97% of their nuclear spent fuel. It works for them. It's a clean energy. It would work here for Nevada and it would work for our country. It's the responsible solution. Ms. Lee, 30 seconds for you. Again, I'm just going to say I'm going to join bipartisan leadership who since 1987 has fought this incredibly dangerous idea. It's dangerous to the health of our community and it's dangerous to our economy. And I think that we have an opportunity to become a leader in uh, clean energy and use that to be our economic driver, not storing the nation's high level nuclear waste here. Thank you very much and stay with us. The CD3.
CBS This Morning. Welcome back to our Congressional District 3 debate. One of the biggest threats to Nevada is the potential for running out of water. Right now, the Bureau of Reclamation says there is a 52% chance the government will declare federal shortage conditions on the river in the next two years, and that chance continues to increase through 2021 and 2022. The Colorado River has been over allocated for some eight decades. It is the most litigated river in the U.S., which makes it difficult to come up with some solutions. So, Ms. Lee, I'll begin with you. Uh, what would you do to ensure the future of the Colorado River and Lake Mead for Nevadans? You know, um, prior to moving to Las Vegas, I worked for an environmental consulting firm and actually dealt with water issues. And it is an incredibly complicated issue. Uh, so many actors and so many states involved. You know, I'm proud that I will be a bipartisan leader, and I think that's what it's going to take to solve this issue. We have to we have to work with the Colorado River Commission, with states, you know, California, Arizona, Utah. And, you know, I mean, basically our water policy right now in this country does not lend itself to conserving water. So, you know, it's going to be a matter of we run into crisis situation in California that's going to bring them to the table. But honestly, we all need to come to the table. I know the Water Authority has led the way in terms of uh, conserving, and we need to continue to do that. But it's really about reaching across the aisle, bringing people to the table, and coming up with a regional solution. And with a minute to reply, Mr. Tarkanian, same question. Uh, if you're in Congress, elected to Congress, what would you do to ensure the future of the Colorado River? This like very, me? very serious problem facing Clark County and much of the western United States is it going to be solved by general talking points and claiming you're going to work bipartisanship. You need to have solutions, some common sense solutions. I believe we need to bring in a pipeline pipeline from up in the Washington, Seattle, uh, Vancouver area that has excess snow and waterfall that goes into the, the, the Pacific Ocean, bring that all the way down into Southern California or Northern California. Northern California could then fill uh, the water needs for the Southern California area and then Nevada would get more of the uh, Lake Mead and uh, Colorado River uh, portion of it. It's got to be a common sense solution and you have to work with other states and it's going to be costly. But we could spend three trillion dollars fighting wars overseas that we had no business fighting with over there. We could spend 1.2 billion dollars a year putting troops in South Korea for what is 70, 80 years. But we can't take care of a water shortage that is crucial to the western United States, including here in Clark County. I will work with both parties with common sense solutions. Ms. Lee, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. You know what? I mean, this water shortage obviously is a part of climate change. And uh, we as a country need to take some serious steps to reduce uh, the impact of climate change here in our country. And there are many possible solutions to the water crisis, including a desalinization plant in Mexico and then using their allocation. Again, you need to come to the table and have a conversation and uh, set priorities and set a strategy. And Mr. Tarkanian, 30 seconds uh, for your rebuttal. The desalination would not work uh, unless the Mexico government approves it and California is fighting. They won't do it because environmental problems it would cause. I don't think that's the right solution. The one I gave you I think is much better. Uh, but not, again, I've lived in this community for 45 years. It isn't climate change that's causing the water shortage. It's the growth of the number of people living in this community as it is in Southern California. It isn't going to be solved by using talking points about climate change. We have to bring in more water from the sources that are available right now. Uh, President Trump and Republicans have said passing a budget is a priority for Congress. They blame Democrats during the Obama administration for failing to pass the budget when they controlled the House. But two years into the new administration, there still has not been a formal budget adopted. So both of you have expressed frustration at the inability to accomplish this most basic constitutional task. So Mr. Tarkanian, you're first on this one with a minute to reply. Are there any circumstances under which you would vote uh, to shut down the federal government over the lack of a budget? Budget. Look at this is a problem with Washington DC. It's dysfunction and it's why so many people distrust their politicians because they can't make the tough choices. We need people in Washington DC that are going to work for the betterment of the people in our communities and in our country and that means you're going to have to give in to some things that you don't agree with that the other party wants so that they'll give you some of the things that you don't agree with. Right now we have partisanship that says we're not going to do anything for you if we don't get everything and vice versa. I'm going to work with both parties to get that done. What I shut down the government. I'm not the kind of guy that says this is a line in the sand. We're not going to uh, we're not going to fund anything if you don't give me everything I want. 
as Harry Reid once said, and I hate to quote Harry Reid, but Harry Reid once said, uh, politics, uh, uh, legislation is the art of compromise. You have to compromise, but you want people in there that are going to be working hard to get the best terms possible for what they believe in, and that's what I will do. Hmm. Uh, Ms. Lee, uh, you're next. Are there any circumstances in which you would vote to shut down the federal government over the lack of a budget? You know, the dysfunction in Washington and the divisiveness is precisely why I decided to run for Congress, because I'm fed up with Washington more concerned about party over our country, about special interests over working families. And uh, I have, like I said, I have the seal of approval from no labels. I intend to be part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is one Democrat joins with the Republican. It's up to 48 now, and really focused on trying to bring us together to have solutions. 2006 was the last time we had a budget, a full budget passed in this country, and that we've had 30 continuing resolutions for the past 10 years. I believe that we need to start to work together. We need to have a changes in rules so that uh, Congress can start working for the middle of America again. Mr. Arcanian, 30 yeah. seconds. Again, my opponent talks about the dysfunction of Washington, D.C., and then she quotes uh, the No Labels Group, and she talks about uh, other type of uh, committees within Washington, D.C. The problem is it's not a, a party problem. It's a, it's a Washington, D.C. problem. It's the Republicans at fault, the Democrats at fault. We need to bring people in Washington, D.C. that's going to stand up to those people. I've done that from the time I've been an adult. I've been a fighter. I never give up. That's what we need in Washington, D.C. to get this done. Uh, Ms. Lee, 30 seconds to you. Danny, you're trying to con voters uh, like you've conned everyone you've worked with. And the bottom line is you said in your last debate just a few months ago that Donald Trump has a solid vote for you because he endorsed you and you'll be with him. And this is an issue where I am making a pledge to work across the aisle to solve problems, and that's exactly what I've done in this community, which is why I've gotten the results here and what I plan to do in Congress. All right, well, stay with us. The debate will be right back with individual questions for both candidates. News Now Community Pride Partners. Welcome back for this next part of the debate. We will be asking individual questions of each of the candidates. Candidates will have one minute to answer and there will be no rebuttal from the other candidate. If the moderator asks a follow-up question, you will have 30 seconds to answer it. Ms. Lee, you have the first individual question. If elected, one of the first votes that you will cast in Congress is to select your party's next minority leader or speaker. Uh, would you vote for California Democrat Nancy Pelosi as your party leader if you're elected? You know, as I am out talking to people in Nevada, the big issue that they ask me about is health care 
education and bringing here jobs that pay the bills. Uh, you know, I believe that America wants and Nevada wants a Congress that works together. So I'm going to support a leader who is going to adopt a rule changes that are going to move uh, the Congress more towards the middle. Uh, like I said, I am going to be part of the Problem Solvers Caucus. There's proposals called Break the Gridlock, and I'm going to ask that the next leader sign on to rule changes that will help uh, keep the fringe from controlling Congress. That being said, I will also support a leader who opposes Yucca Mountain. Uh, uh, with 30 seconds uh, uh, for a follow-up, uh, is, is that leader Nancy Pelosi? I didn't hear you, you know say what? yes or no. First of all, I'm not going to put the cart ahead of the horse. I'm uh, really focused right now on getting elected by the voters of Congressional District 3. I don't know who the choices are, and I certainly don't want to give uh, any of my negotiating power away by making a decision before I know who the choices are. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tarkan, you have come out against uh, term limits, or rather, uh, in support of term limits, let me correct that, pardon me, most recently in a TV ad featuring uh, you and your entire family, and as you know, in a, a federal court in 1995 invalidated state-based efforts to do that, to impose term limits on members of Congress. So if elected, would you only commit to serving a, a certain number of terms in the House, and if so, how many? Yeah. One minute. First of all, I have, again, before the, the uh, commercial break, my opponent made some misstatements I'm going to have to correct. Uh, if you follow her campaign, you're going to see it's very dishonest and deceives the public because she can't win on the issues we're talking about. I have never said that I was a reliable vote for Donald Trump because he endorsed me. In fact, I've only said I'm a reliable vote for the American first policies he's articulated because I believe those are the policies that are making our country a better place. And I would vote against Donald Trump when he wanted things that fell outside of those American first policies such as the omnibus bill. Second of all, when you start talking about conning the people, there is no bigger con than running a campaign claiming that your biggest asset is running two nonprofits that take millions and millions of dollars from the public school system and from the city and the county taxpayers and use that in, to, in failing programs like MASH that failed, that the executive director said it, it didn't accomplish anything. They had small, ineffective uh, board, board members, which my opponent was a member of. Okay, I do need to ask then, as the follow-up, uh, with 30 seconds, would you commit to term limits? Oh, absolutely. I think, first of all, term limits can be passed in Washington, D.C. by passing a law and getting um, ratified by two-thirds of the state legislature. So it can be done and it should be done. We have it in every other elected official in Washington, D.C. Yes, I would commit to term limits. I've, uh, I've said uh, 12 years for a congressman and 12 years, two terms for a senator. Okay, Mr. Tarkanian, thank you very much. We will be right back with closing statements from our candidates.
Welcome back for the final part of this debate. We will have closing statements. You each have 30 seconds and there is no rebuttal time. Mr. Tarkanian, you may go first. My family and I have lived in this community for 45 years. I've spent most of my adult life trying to make this a better community and a better country. The place I think I could make the most effect, the most positive effect for the people of Southern Nevada and for our country is in Washington, D.C. because Nevadans need someone who will stand up for the middle class, hardworking Nevadans, someone who's a fighter, someone who will never quit, someone who can take the punches but keep defending and fighting for what's best for the people of Nevada. I hope that when you go to the polls to, to vote in November, you will vote for Danny Tarkania for Congress. Congress in District 3. Ms. Lee, you have 30 seconds for your closing statements. Okay, before I do that, I want to invite voters to go to the website TarkanianTruth.com to support any statement I made about my opponent tonight. Uh, listen, I'm a mother of two. I've been a longtime education advocate and a nonprofit leader of successful nonprofits here in this community. Washington quit working for working families a long time ago. I've rolled up my sleeves. I've taken on big problems and produced results here in Nevada for 25 years. That's exactly what I want to do in Washington, and I hope I earn your vote. All right, that's where we will leave it. We have run out of time. We'd like to sincerely thank both candidates for participating in today's Congressional District 3 debate. Debates are a staple of uh, running for office, but participation is certainly not required. And so when candidates do agree to participate, the information that voters get, we think, helps them make a decision when they go to the polls. Uh, so we at 8 News Now want to encourage everyone to go to the polls, get registered, get educated, and vote. Early voting starts October 20th. Election Day is November 6th. Again, if you want to watch the full debate, including last week's first half, go to LasVegasNow.com, click on News, and it's the Your Local Election Headquarters tab there in the News section. Thank you so much. Have a great night, a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you back here next week.